It's time for To The Last Drop Podcast with Liam Delcom and Brendan Nell. This is To The Last Drop. I'm yep. Liam Delcom. And I'm Brendan Nell. In this week's episode, we have a returnee, a man who was on our show last week, Gavin Rich, uh, writer for Supersport and a few other publications. Uh I'm sure, Gavin, uh, that you've uh, observed a couple of things since we last spoke that would have given you some proper insights into the second test uh, ahead of us, Ireland against the Springboks in Durban, uh, the Irish hoping to secure uh, a draw in the series. Uh, what have you made of the first one and what are, we, what are we kind of looking forward to in the second? Well, as you said, I've seen some things. I've seen some talking heads down at the team hotel. Uh, you know what uh, press conferences are like these days. So... Um, I remember the old days when we went on tour, the, 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 the guys, the supporters would come up and say, is the man a uh, I can't answer that question because we don't, we're not as close and, and intimate with them as we used to be, not, not intimate in, in, in a sort of sordid way. Um, no. But uh, I, I certainly think that, um, I certainly think that the momentum that people speak, uh, spoke about last week when the box won uh, is being carried through into this week. The, I think the guys are all very positive. There's a there's a there's a feeling that, uh, although not every uh, rugby writer in South Africa might agree, there is a feeling that the Springboks are on the right track. And uh, you know, um, I've sp- we've, we had a couple of interviews with guys this afternoon, some of the backline players, and uh, Jesse Creel and and Damian Delendi, all very positive about the contribution of of um, one Tony Brown, of course, the former All Black fly half and and Japan Japan. Uh, assistant coach. He has never he, ever head coach, was he there? I actually was, was trying to figure that out the other day. Um, as far as I know, he was always assistant to Jamie Joseph. But anyway, um, they, 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 there's, there's a lot of positivity. Not everything worked last week, but there's a feeling that uh, you know we've, we've got a whole lot more threats in, in our attacking game now than, than, than we used to have. Uh, and without sacrificing the strengths and the old strengths, of course, being running around the court, you know, when it comes to attacking uh, you know, attacking around the corner onto the opposition line. And our defence, although it became a little bit porous towards the end of the game last week, um, is, uh, I think, is, t- is still on track as well. Brendan, I put it to you. Uh, Ireland, are they on the back foot? Uh, they obviously went 1-0 down, but they also picked up a couple of uh, injuries that um, I don't think it'll, it'll help their cause. I think now they're probably scrambling to get the best... Uh, potential 15 onto the field. Yeah, I, I think that's so much. You know, they, they've got quite, quite a lot of depth. I mean, we keep on talking when we talk about Leinster about how much depth they have in Munster as well. Um, yeah, to me, uh, I was listening to another podcast, the, the Times podcast, and Peter O'Reilly, the Irish writer, mm-hmm. was talking about um, yeah, how it's the end of the season and fatigue. And I, I was perplexed because you know, our guys, are also most of them, are at the end of their season. Maybe not the Japan guys, but Certainly the guys playing in the UFC in Europe are at the end of this season as well. And um, no one in the spring week camp is talking about fatigue. So I think Ireland have got a bit of a problem. I think they've got enough out of that test to keep them uh, motivated and ready to, to go ham, hammer and tongs into that second test. But, um, yeah, I think there is a little bit of a worry there that maybe, maybe the box just are on a bit of a better psychological and physical high then then they are going into this test. I'm, I'm not sure if yeah, that's just talk and that's just the the vibe around this, but um you sort of get that idea that there's two different mindsets in the two different camps. Yeah, I think if you look at the island season, I mean it's it's been an up and down one for them. They they obviously had that stunning win against the Springboks in pool play at the World Cup. They went on, uh, obviously, they, they got knocked out of that tournament. Uh, they bounced back very well in the Six Nations, uh, winning that competition, although not as convincing as last season. Uh, some of their players, or their top players then, um, if you look at their clubs, didn't quite get the results they wanted in the URC. Uh, and of course, then of course they lose the first test here. Um, it's been a bit of a mixed bag for them. So they would want to go out on a high, Gavin. Um, you know, it, are we overplaying this? That you know, it, is the second test as important as we make it out to be? Yes, it is. But it is it is important. I think it's very important for South Africa and for them. I don't think that they they want to lose a series to South Africa. Uh, they won a series in New Zealand, broke new ground, crossed the frontier uh, two years ago. 
So I think that they they very much want to want to want to win, and it, and it, it is a huge uh, matter of pride. I mean, I looked at the world rankings today. South Africa have gone four points ahead. I know not, not everybody pays that much attention to world rankings, but uh, you know that's quite a big margin. I'm not sure. You guys can maybe correct me. I'm not sure that South Africa has ever been that far ahead since the world rankings came in. Even in 2009, I looked. We were never further than about one one point ahead because the All Blacks, of course, were much better in those days. They're not. Um, they've 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 slipped a bit. So. And obviously, beating Ireland, who's the number team, two team in the world, means that the, the, the Springboks got quite a lot of points from last week's game. But uh, just from on, from an Ireland point of view, is I don't think that um, I would read too much neg- too much into sort of like the sort of aura of negativity that or the attitude of negativity that appears to be coming out of there. I think that um, in, a, in a rugby match, often when you watch a, a game in a series. Um, and or when a team's playing an, another team, and you know they're going to play against each other soon, you look at the momentum at the end of the game, and the, and, the, and Ireland had quite a lot of momentum at the end of end of the game at, at Loftus, and I think that that will give them some confidence. They they struggled in the first half. They battled to. I think the box surprised them. I think the box surprised them with the expansiveness of their game. Um, they struggled uh, initially. They gave away that early try, and for the first half hour, maybe the first whole, whole half. Uh, they were pretty much dominated, I thought, by the box, but uh, they didn't they didn't fall too far behind, and they were five points behind. And then in the second half, they they, they weathered a storm, I think, initially in the in the in the third quarter, but then they came right. They came they came right later in the game, and and I think that will give them a lot of confidence. I think that that that, that will that will make them think that um, they can maybe even even matters on on Saturday. Come back probably at, and and give give South Africa a good go and start better this time than they did at Loftus. Apart from the way they finished that game, also historically, if you go back to the series they won in New Zealand, uh, they had to bounce back. Uh, is there anything they can take out of that or that experience? I know that a lot of the play, you know, some of the players have obviously survived from that series. Uh, is there anything there that they can draw on um, in the second test, Brendan? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, I agree with Kevin to a large extent about the momentum thing. If you look at the stats, I mean, Ireland had 90% possession in the last 10 minutes. I think it was 88 or 90, somewhere around there. And, um, yeah, they certainly, uh, other than that last scrum of the Springboks, uh, yeah, they they certainly were on the front foot. And they, they had a couple of calls go against them in that time as well. But you certainly had the sense they could easily, if one or two calls got, went differently, come back and won that game. Uh, so there'll definitely be enough to keep them interested. And they'll do that history. They'll talk about this being their last week of the season and giving them all, and you were really hearing it in some of the press conferences that they're doing. Um, and and yeah, they've they've got nothing to lose um, coming into this game. Uh, yeah, so they everybody sort of expects when I say everybody, probably the South African public expects that they they're probably going to lose the second test. So yeah, it's they've got every, they, everything's in the way in their favour to to cause that upset. Sea level at Durban will suit them a lot more than the altitude did. Although, I mean, they, they've made so many breaks in that game that they, the altitude wasn't really affected, Loftus. Um, so, but I think they will definitely draw New Zealand in that experience. And they, and depending on, on, on who comes in, um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you take, if say now Robbie Henshaw goes out and Gary Ringrose comes in, that's not really, you're not really losing too much there. Um, yeah, and, and especially Ronan Keller coming in for Dan Sheehan. Yeah, I mean, th- th- these are both extremely um, you know, experienced players. So I don't think Ireland's going to be any weaker. I think at, at the end of the day, it comes down to which team sort of adapts better to what happened the week before. And I've often heard coaches say that playing a team two weeks in a row is quite difficult because especially if you win, there's a lot more motivation for the side that lost to fix things and to come up with ways of stopping you than there is when you win. Um because you're just trying to do things better when you come back. So I don't know. I think there's a lot in this game still. I, I, I don't think um, I don't think it's going to be an easy game. I think it's just going to be as difficult as Loftus. And uh, yeah, I think we've got an epic encounter on our hands. And it's going, and the, the, I just the, got the, the impression epic. that if you, I know it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one, but uh, they didn't have the man um, available to them. But the loss of Jamison Gibson Park. Um, I think for that Ireland team is absolutely massive. I, I think Craig Casey did a fantastic job in his absence. However, I just felt, especially on attack, Ireland just didn't have the same, uh, I don't want to use the word urgency, but they just weren't as slick, they weren't as assured as they usually 
are uh, with the ball in hand when, when they put the ball through phases and they, they build continuity through those phases. Uh, I think they certainly lacked something there. Not that there's anything they can do about that now. Uh, okay. yes, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, thought, I was watching Brendan. I'm waiting for Brendan. I always not get accused of, of interrupting. So, so this, um, now, I, look, I, I think that the way I look at it, I, I, I sort of like which which team can, can be better this weekend. And yes, Ireland can certainly be better, but I've got a feeling that the Springboks can be a whole lot better. I think they can be a lot tighter than they were. Um, and I'm not when I say tighter, I'm not jumping on the bandwagon of those people who say that they must uh, lose their expansive game. But I, I think that the, the South Africans um, made mistakes last week. I think that they um, probably been working this week on, on the breakdown. They've been working on trying to combat the Irish tactics at the breakdown. We, we saw last week how much pressure they put on Faf de Klerk around the fringes. Uh, and I think that um, the Springboks will probably have come up with some kind of plan there. I think they'll probably also be better in the scrums than they were last week. I know we all talk about that dominating uh, end scrum that effectively clinched the game for the box but you know it was um it was a bit problematic in the first in the first half and, and there was definitely Ireland were getting away with a little bit of technical spoiling and I think that the that the, 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 the box have, have worked on addressing this week you, you can never tell uh, I mean something what the biggest changes often in, in in games like between one game and another are often in those areas like in the scrums or in the lineouts a team can misfunction completely in those areas on one week and then the following week because they've worked at it suddenly they suddenly they they're on top of their game and i think that could be the same in the in the in the, in the loose forwards i think that is going to be another titanic struggle in the loose forwards i think it's going to be both teams are going to attract the ball ball fer- ferociously and um yeah it's going to be it's going to be quite a yeah it's going to be quite, it's going to be quite a contest i just think that the springboks are going to be better than they were last week significantly better I'm not so sure about Ireland, although I agree with Brendan. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, Ronan Kelleher coming in for Dan Sheehan isn't a huge loss. And Conor Murray has, has massive experience and uh, he's been around the block a few times. So as Rossi said yesterday, he will bring, and I see it's getting dark here. Um, as Rossi said yesterday, um, uh, you know, he'll bring some calmness because both those guys are, are relatively young. I know. Jack Crowley has played more than Casey at, at, at international level. But um, having a young guy with him last week might have been, uh, yeah, a little bit uh, problematic for, for Crowley. Now he's got the old hand there and he's got Conor Murray uh, at, at Kings Park at sea level. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's obviously one thing in their favour. They don't have to think about the, the, the sea level this week, if indeed they did last week. Uh, something was mentioned earlier, and uh, I think either of you can grab this, uh, about the, the Springbok attack and how they used with uh, the effectiveness and of, of Peter Steff to tour in the wide channels, along with Sia Kulisi on the other flank. Um, it, you know, by and large, it, it looked impressive, but there were also patches in the second half where you thought they were maybe just overdoing it, and there were a couple of Hail Mary passes uh, where things might have or should have been a little bit more, uh, should have been played a bit tighter, perhaps. Um, yeah. What did you make of that, Brendan? Because, uh, you know, there were certainly some positives there and they looked good. I mean, that opening try was was spectacular. It was breathtaking. Uh, but, of course, it's very difficult to sustain that kind of intensity on attack across 80 minutes. I agree with you. I think at times they did, uh, did overdo it a bit. I, I went back and watched the game. And some, you know, it's quite funny when you watch the game live in a press box and Loftus being a very, you know, sort of enclosed sort of glass box, terrible press box in, in that way. With so people shouting in your ear. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wasn't the... I wasn't the, the friendliest person when people are doing running commentary in the press box. So, um, I try to concentrate on the game. But uh, uh, be that as it may, uh, yeah, the, I, I, think, um, I think you can see that they're trying. I think they, oh, they want to use the word audacity, but the, the, but the, the, the sort of um, confidence they had in trying out a new game against the number two team in the world. Uh, when you number one. I mean, most teams would stick to what they did that won a World Cup. And the fact that they were willing to do that and they got immediate results perhaps pr- probably seduced them a little bit into thinking it was going to be a lot easier than it was. And then when you watch the replay of the game, I mean, I, I realized they left four or five tries out there. Uh, there was especially one where 
Um, I, I can't remember who broke through, but Curtin Orenson knocked on the ball with an open try line in front of him. Uh, yeah, and, th- and that doesn't normally happen. Uh, and and the tries they scored, were, you know, the Cheslin's one was out of sheer personal brilliance. Um, mm. Yeah, those type of things. Yeah, are, 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 they they used on the end of the day, but they they certainly left a lot out there, and they should be a lot better this week. But I think we got to realize they are between game plans at the moment. Um, and it's going to take a while, and their first priority is is to win this game. So perhaps at times, yeah, I think there's nothing that stops them from going back to plan A um, or plan B, shall I say, the plan that won them the World Cup when, when, uh, if things don't go well for them. Uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting game to see how they manage this. And, of course, Ireland will have expected this and they'll have analysed this quite a bit. And probably the way they got their defence right, especially in that second half, and the way they attacked the box at the breakdown, if they do that again, I think they'll see they, they have quite a good chance of, of, of doing it again and turning over quite a bit of ball again. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be fascinating. Uh, in a way, it's like a chess game, I suppose, guys. I mean, it's just... Yeah, we're going to see what's the next move from both sides. And I don't mm. think we, there's so many ifs and buts. And if this guy does that, then that guy does that. That's going to be very interesting. I see Gavin's fading away into the darkness, by the way. The Durban Sunset, sir. Uh... Um, um, Kate, do you want to turn the light on for me quickly? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, my, my daughter's doing that quickly. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say that I, in my match report. Thanks, Kate. In my. Yeah, there we go. Uh, in my match report, coming from the North well, Coast, um, uh, in my match report, in, in my match report on supersport.com, I, I did say that um, I thought that there were times in that game when the box reminded me a little bit too much of, of the Stormers, which is what Liam was saying when we talk about hey, how Mary Park passes. Not quite as ready to get the rid of the ball as quickly as, as the Stormers, maybe. Uh, there is no Chiva Daimani or, or, or Warwick Gallant in, in the box side. But um, there they, they, they were times when they were a bit loose. But those are teething problems that I think, you know, that you, that you, that, that, that will come out. Um, I just think it was it was quite phenomenal in retrospect uh, that they actually won against the second best team in the world. And it was more comfortable. I know they were nervous in the end and that Ireland came back and they were with seven points. But it was more comfortable than I think we anticipated it being. I just want to say that it's a pity that we don't have Bernard Jackman on, on the show like we well, like like we did last week because I think that there were times in that game when I felt that some of the words that he, he had in, the, in this podcast last week were, were eerily pro- prophetic. You'll remember that he said that he felt that the one chance that Ireland would have is if South Africa are between games. In other words, uh, you know, and he mentioned that Jock at, at, at Leinster has put them a little bit between games in the sense that they've moved from being an attack orientated team to one that sort of like, you know, emphasizes the defense a lot more than they did. And he did say that he thought that with Tony Brown obviously coming in, uh, you know, Tony Brown he would, would never have agreed to the to, to take the job um, if Rassi hadn't told him that that their philosophy or or that Brown's that Tony Brown's philosophy was sort of where the box wants to go right now. So um, so I think that that he was on the money. I mean Bernard last week when he said that the one chance Ireland have. And it was the one chance that they had because uh, when the Springboks got loose, that was when they allowed the, the, the Irish back into the game. Now, the interesting thing here is do the Springboks feel emboldened enough to continue, continue on that path uh, this week or do they just go for the series and make sure they get it and they can revert back uh, to what they're trying to achieve in terms of that long-term objective in the attack? Uh, once they take battle or do battle against uh, Portugal a bit later on um, and, and then even obviously go into rugby championship. Or is it is it the case of the, go full throttle now? I think that, I think that the, you've, got to look at, you've got to remember where they played that last game. They played it at Loftus. It's a fast field. Um, mm. You look at the, at the URC games um, and in the past Super Rugby games that were played there, any, any, any game they've played at Loftus normally is quite high scoring. And I remember sitting when it was 13-8 heading towards the hour mark in this last game. And I was thinking, this is most unlike a Loftus game because it looked like it was going to be a low-scoring game. And then there was a flurry score, uh, scoring at the end. So I think that the box probably were always intending to try and out-tempo them a bit and, 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 and run, run wide in that game last week, surprise them. And, and on the faster surface, because Loftus is a faster surface, surface than Kings Park, 
I think that it's 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 it, in Durban there'll be a little bit more balance. I think that there'll be a bit more um, that old word pragmatism uh, to to mm. to the Bok approach. I don't think they're going to put it away though. I think that they the the players are just way too excited about this new way. Uh, uh, somebody like Jesse Creel, for instance, is getting the ball now. Um, on attack as much as he gets it when he's playing club rugby in Japan, and and, and that 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 really excites him, and rightly so. So, and somebody like Damien Delendi has finally been recognised for one of his biggest strengths, which some some coaches have recognised in the past, but often it's been like sort of neglected, which is he's one of the best passers of the ball around. So the South African distribution skills are, you know. There's there's so much potential in this box team, so I don't think they're going to want to put it away now. I do understand what you're saying, though. There's there's other games to come. This isn't the end of the game, end of the season for the box like it is for Ireland. This isn't like our sort of only chance to sort of um, to to show what we've got. We've got other opportunities to do it. Um, watching the games last week, uh, you know, obviously the All Blacks will always be tough in the rugby championship, but uh, you know, I think we can. <laughs> I know we've got a bad record in Australia. But uh, I think you can go to the you can go to the Wallabies and you can experiment a bit with selections and with game plan. Um, and and Ditto Argentina, uh, where you're playing them at home and away. It's 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 just the All Blacks that you know you have to sort of take a sort of real gravitas approach to. Um, and I think it's I, I think yeah I, I think that um, I think on Saturday that the the box are going to play to win. I mean not that they didn't this last week. I think that they thought that the way to win last week was to to surprise them and to out temper them early on and to, but uh, yeah. So in the next ne- on, on Saturday, I think we're going to see a more pragmatic approach, a tighter approach. But I think I have a feeling that we're going to actually see the box score more tries than they did at Loftus. Uh, actually, win by more, win by more rather than rather than score more tries. I think I think that's more to the point. Um, I don't think they're going to. I mean, they scored three tries at Loftus, so it's it's going to be going some. But I think that we're going to. I think we're still going to be chatting about the Springbok attacking game after on, on Saturday night and and talking positively about it. I think uh, just to jump in there, guys, um, and just say as well, um, the the one thing I think why we I think they'll probably a bit be more pre- pragmatic, uh, knowing the box like we do, they they weren't, wouldn't have been happy with the way the scrums went. Um, they would have put a, Don would have put a lot of work in that this week um, to get make sure that's right to be a lot more clever. Bongi spoke about it. Also this week about having a much fairer contest there, um, so I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Plus they they, they were quite happy with their lineouts, but they weren't happy with their mall. I didn't stop their mall quite easily, um, and I think that'll also be a work on this week. So sometimes you know when they when they factor those sort of things in, it takes away from the rest of it. I don't think they're going to go away from the expansion, but there might be, as you, as Gavin says, just a bit, bit more pragmatism in that, and. Um, of course, then they've still got the six-two bench, which will, yeah, which is as dangerous as we keep on hearing it is. Um, I suppose dangerous to the scoreline more than anything else. Uh, and and uh, yeah, we'll we'll see that come on again. And I'm sure, I'm sure this week they'll be looking for more of a sort of front domination, yeah, you know, in the set pieces to to set up that, and give them more of a platform to to attack more out wide. Yeah, I think, I think, I think this week also the boot will be quite important uh, more than perhaps last week. Um, I, I think given, as Gavin described it earlier, the uh, Pretoria or the Highfield does is, is, it provides you a faster playing surface. So in, at Kings Park, you're probably going to see more tactical kicking. But then equally, um, goal kicking is going to become important, especially if it's going to be a tight game again. And I think some Springbok supporters were perhaps a bit uh, concerned by what happened at, at, at Loftus. Uh, I'm not that concerned because uh, if you look at Andre Pollard's record, um, overall, his average overall is basically mirrored by his kicking stats uh, at the South African coast. It, it doesn't drip, dip at all. It's exactly the same. So um, in terms of his his history kicking in Durban and Cape Town or wherever, um, it's, it basically mirrors you know, his, his average overall. I was just going to say, Brendan, that you, you know, you, you're going on, uh, you, you were mentioning the the, the, the box didn't dominate it. Well, they didn't dominate in some areas of forward like they would have expected to. And I, and I think that just to, to some extent, forwards are their own sort of different breed of animal, uh, different beasts. I mean, you can go, I remember a Curry Cup final in Durban in 2001 or 2000. Uh, I think it was 2000 where Western Province won because <laughs> very early in the game, I think there were two intercept tries um, from 
Peter Rousseau and, and Brayton Fulso also scored a breakaway and, and Province won that game. And apparently the, 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 the Sharks forwards were still celebrating in the, in the, stadium, in the, in the um, change room afterwards because they had won the forward battle, even though I think the final score was something like 25-15. So I think that the, the, the Springbok pack will, will feel that, that, that there's that testosterone thing, that sort of physicality, that sort of Neanderthal sort of like forward sort of hodum, and to use an Afrikaans word, where we want to sort of show them that, that, that we, we're not going to be bossed. So I think that there, that there will be that aspect as well, as I think that they're going to try and get them all to work this time. They're going to make sure that the scrums um, are more on point this time and that that dominant scrum we saw right at the end of the last week's game happens more frequently, although that um, would be a bit freaky if it, if, if it happened too often in the game. But, um, yeah, I, I just I just think that just like Ireland, as, and because Rossi is right, just like Ireland will have been stung by the defeat last week and will have a point to prove, I think the South African pack will feel that they've got a point to prove. And that's dangerous for Ireland. Just like Liam's point uh, about Andre Pollard, and, and, and I'm also not too worried. He's a guy who, who's, who's got those clutch moments. He, had, he didn't have a great day at the office. I, I, yeah, uh, Tony Brown did say afterwards that he was fatigued and tired. Um, hadn't played for a while. I think let's just quickly to Tony's comments there and then we can chat a bit further. I think on Andre, he played his last game was two months ago. So I know in, in a game of rugby, when you're tired and a little bit of fatigue sits in, then the quality of your goal kicking definitely goes down. I'm not concerned about Andre's goal kicking. He'll be with a, another game under his belt. Um, you know, his. his Ability to sort of be conditioned to go again, um, you'll be fine kicking goals. He's kicked, kicked well all week, but that's when you're fresh, when you're tired and at Loftus and you get into that second half. Um, you know, I just think it was fatigue, nothing nothing to do with his goal kicking. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm hoping it's just a bit. Um, yeah, there's not there's not much you can say about Andre, but yeah, certainly if the box had had those two, three extra kicks. Uh, the scoreline might look very different, and mm. the pressure on them in those last 20 and on Ireland would have been very different in that game. Was there not a case in that game, Brendan, of, um, you know, you, you were at the press conference. I wasn't in Joburg last week um, or in Pretoria. Uh, you were at the press conference where Tony Brown was talking about uh, Andre being a sort of a work in progress. and uh, You know, reading between the lines, he was saying he wants him to be more direct and play closer to the game line and all that. Is there not a sort of uh, a tendency sometimes when you're working on, an, on on a certain aspect of your of your all round game, where sometimes your core sort of strengths might get neglected a bit? Not not that he neglected it, but that you know it was a different. You know, he had a new challenge last week. He had a challenge that he had to sort of give whatever he had to bring whatever Tony Brown wanted him to bring. Yeah, I think also if you look at the the type of passes in that game. He was throwing a lot of these skip bullet passes, um, you know, sort of skipping out two guys and getting the ball quickly down the line and concentrating on that. You sort of wonder, maybe, maybe that's he's not used to playing that game. He hasn't played that for a long time. He didn't take the ball up like Tony said he'd like to see him take it up more to the game line a lot more. Uh, he was more distributor in that game. So, uh, but yeah, I think yeah, that's again, it's it's part of the evolving process. Yeah, you know, has been. If, if there's any criticism of him, it's the fact that he's probably sat in the pocket a bit um, over the last couple of years and sort of sat back a bit more and dictated with the boot. And, and um, you know, sometimes to change that, um, we haven't been watching the, the Tigers that much. So we don't know how that, I mean, I haven't seen him play that much for them. But, uh, yeah, you know, sometimes to get out of that rough. To that point, but, uh, well, it's more than so uh, just to Gavin's earlier point, uh, when you talk about Handre and the way he distributed there, um, the skip passes, uh, it probably ties into the fact that what Gavin mentioned earlier, it's to get the ball out wide early, maybe bring in the surprise factor and uh, play a game that is fast-tempered, get the ball on the wing, um, stretch them out as, as much as you can, which we may not necessarily see in Durban. I think it, it, it will be, it'll, the box will be presented with a much different challenge uh, and maybe... Uh, a different modus operandi is required. Yeah, I think it's very much there between game plans at the moment. And I think we shouldn't overly analyze it was the first test of the season. Uh, yeah, we in a normal first test, yeah, normally you don't play, or should I say the second test because they played Wales, but you normally wouldn't uh, say that they uh, 
yeah, yeah, we should be at their best by then. We would normally by the rugby championship is where we're looking for them to be a lot better. So I'm not too worried. Uh, yeah, they did get a win. They, I think they were all happy about that. And there certainly was enough to work on as well. And as Rossi said from when, when I, my question at the press conference, he agreed that there was both good and both bad out of that for them. So, and, and that's what coaches want. They've got enough to, enough to work on, enough to, you know, so grind the guys on the Monday and Tuesday, um, yeah, ahead of the next game as well. And, and it's not just rest on your laurels. There's lots of work. And that's what I'm sure they've been doing this, this whole week. Them. Before we run out of time, we should probably uh, touch on the centre combination who will be celebrating a milestone this week as they become uh, the most capped uh, pairing, Bach pairing, um, uh, Damien Dalende and Jesse Creel. Um, Gavin, you've seen quite a bit of them. Um, it's, it's one of those pairings that... <sighs> They didn't necessarily come together naturally, but there were obviously other players who were more than capable of filling those positions. Um, there have been injuries. There have also been four different Springbok coaches uh, you know, since the first time those two played together in 2015. Um, but it's only over the last two years where they've kind of hit their straps. And again, uh, partly brought together by Lucanio Am's injury. But yeah. what has happened is you have now have a very formidable uh, midfield combination. Yeah, well, it's, it's actually interesting because you know there wasn't it wasn't that long ago when we were thinking of you know, Kanye Am as, as the as the best outside centre in the world. And you'll remember that test we lost and well the Vox lost in Joburg in, in 2022 after having won in Nelspruit and and Lacanya almost kept the Springboks in the game in, in, in that match. I mean, I, I've been a little bit concerned that maybe uh, in Lacanya's case the injuries that he's had have possibly taken away his ability to step. Um, and, that, that, and that might be a problem. But, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, I've always rated Jer- Jesse Creole, certainly on potential. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Damien and Delendi, I mean, he's played sort of, well, he was at the 2015 World Cup, and he's, he's been, he's been, and, and, and now we know that he can almost play two, like, different games, because he, we know he takes the ball up, but he, he's also a very good passer of the ball. Um, and, and Jesse Creole is just, uh, given, has been given that sort of momentum in a way because because of Lacanio's injury, uh, Jesse was 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 given like you know several games in a row. And I remember one of the, I won't say who, but there was a, a coach. Um, well, he was actually a director of rugby rather than a coach in South Africa who was quite concerned when when Lacanio um, was 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 um, was when it was announced that he was not available for the World Cup that he was actually injured. Um, there was a feeling that you know that that the box are going to lose quite a lot by not having Lacanya, and yet Jesse almost turned out to be one of the box players of the tournament. So, um, he, the no, they, they, they've I, I'm just sort of quite flabbergasted that they're beating Jean and Jacques' record because to me it doesn't feel like they, they've mm. been playing together that that long. I mean, I, when I first heard that, in fact, Tony Brown said it. I almost wanted to correct him, like you know, sort of saying no. Oh, you know, I don't think you're right about that, but um, quite, I'm glad I kept quiet. But um, it, do, it does seem almost flabbergasting that I thought that John and Jacques were around forever. I mean, it felt like it felt like they played a lot more than is it 30 mm. tests together. It felt like a lot more than 30 tests. But the, the, the interesting thing is Lucanio also um, played, what is it, 28, 29 tests um, with, with Damien. So, I mean, whoever... Whoever uh, Damon Dalender was going to start the season off with, um, he was yeah. going to break the record with that person. Um, but I mean, as a as a centre pairing, the last two years they've been um, absolutely fantastic. I mean, I described them as uh, on defence certainly as as yard dogs, but they also thoroughbreds. I mean, in in, in yeah. every other sense. Um, yeah. Brendan, does that combination yeah. infuse uh, uh, you, or, or, or do you think, or do you think, or do you think the the Dalende, um uh, Lacanya um, uh, partnership is the better one. Sorry for throwing you under the bus. No, no, no. Listen, guys, uh, you, you talk about Jesse being and uh, them being thoroughbreds. Um, I've had the misfortune, and uh, anybody who knows me, I've had the misfortune of having to gym with Jesse at, at one stage by accident. Uh, we ended up in the same gym, and I, I've anybody who's seen Jesse in the gym knows that um, uh, I don't think he has an ounce of body fat there. He's he's t- Definitely a thoroughbred, but uh, uh, that be that as it may, Gavin, just on your point, um, Jesse was in the 2015, and I think, in fact, they were the combination in the in the game they lost against Japan, because uh, Jesse was the guy who missed the tackle that was the last 
was the last try that gave Japan the victory back then. And you think that just seems like years and years ago. Um, I think on the, on the John oh. Joke thing, and your point there, I think what, what probably made them play a lot less is that John had quite quite a bit of injuries um, yeah, over the years and, and was out with quite serious knee injuries. And that probably probably took away from that record a bit. Uh, yeah, we, it would have been a lot bigger. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, to me, the, the proof is in the pudding. They're playing great rugby. They were playing great rugby at the World Cup. Uh, and you can't really argue with that. And yeah, while it's working, yeah, don't. They don't fix what's, what, what isn't broken, you know? Yeah, I think I also what, what is slightly confusing here is, yeah. is, is, sorry, yeah. Gavin, is, is the, it's almost like they've had two different uh, careers in that uh, you they, they played together for a bit, but then uh, 2017 happened. Uh, there was that bad loss uh, against Ireland in Dublin. Uh, Damien then kind of uh, disappeared off the scene and there was probably an injury or two. Uh, so it took them... Uh, probably three, four years to be reuni- reunited again. So they played again in 2022. So that's probably why you get the sense that they haven't played together that often. Yeah, well, they, 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 you talk about Damien not playing in 2017, and, and that was because the, the forgotten man of South African rugby, I always think of him as the forgotten man, was Jan Serfentain, was actually playing centre, and he was actually probably one of the best players under under, under Alistair Kutzer, and he's and he's never played again. So South Africa has huge depth if you think that um, Jan is still out there playing and, and he could probably be brought in as a as an inside centre. And Damien Willemsen, to me, is, is is probably more of an inside centre than, than he is a fullback. Um, that's just my, my own personal opinion. But um, I was just going to say that um, in a, I was a part of an interview today with, with, with Jesse and I don't want to, like, because it's, a, it's an embargoed one and it's, and it's for, for a week's time. But um, I, just, I just reminded Careful. him... That, I just reminded I just reminded Jesse that because uh, he 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 used the word wing somewhere and I said talking of wings because uh, he'd been talking about John and how he how he always admired John and he ended up playing with John a bit and then he said that um, you know but then he was waiting in the wings and I said yes quite literally I don't know if you guys remember him playing on the wing outside John in um, that mm-hmm. game against Argentina yeah. in, in in Durban in, in two thousand and fifteen. Under Hanika Mayer, where the Springboks uh, were probably the most one of the most embarrassing performances, certainly on home fields, um, only maybe eclipsed by a couple of years later at exactly that same venue. When, um, when in fact it was a year later when New Zealand did did, did us fifty seven fifteen. But um, yeah, it's uh, it, so, so that's what you also forget about. I mean Jesse, because Jesse Jesse's only thirty, so he must have been like twenty two then. And I remember when he first came in and was playing centre, there was always a debate about whether he should be playing centre or fullback because it was actually as a as a fullback that he first came into onto the scene. And um, I remember everybody saying, and I always I used to write back in the day, and maybe it was because Lacanio had had sort of established himself at thirteen, and I've always felt that Jesse was too too good a player to leave out. I used to often say that he should be playing wing, and I, you know, and I look, I mean, I'm going to be unpopular for saying this, but there are still times when I feel, when I watch the box play, and I, there are still times when I sort of think, well, as brilliant as we as our two smaller wings are, there are times when I do wish we had one big big guy there, uh, like a, a you know big, big strongly built guy there, just in certain situations when you're a couple of meters out of, from the line, and you want to use that physical force to get through, um, and you're not and it's not stepping in, in pace, and um, Jesse to me is often sort of. I've often thought that he could he could probably have done well at wing as well um, if he'd if he'd been asked to play in that position. Uh, but uh, it was great seeing him on Saturday playing. Um, I don't think that the Springboks have, have have tried to play the ball to an outside centre on attack as much as that probably since the days of Donny Herber. And um, he, he he really revelled it. And as I say, he 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 does like to get the ball in his hands and. He is like the sort of obviously the the, the, the key man on defence as the as the number thirteen always is, uh, and he is very good at that as well. And that's what he was really renowned for um, in the in well in the in the not too distant past. But now we're seeing his full his, the, his full array of talents and his full and his and his full sort of arsenal, if you like. Yeah, he, he certainly doesn't mind the rough stuff. Uh, I remember there was a game. It was either the quarter final or the semi final at the World Cup last year. He came into a mixed zone. Um, after the match, and very early on, he was quite happy to sort of um, put his his hand on on his on his head, 
uh, to show us there was a battle scar that he was quite keen to show us. He said, uh, you know, he was making the point that, you know, um, they, they're not scared to get stuck in and sort of bleed for the cause. And, you know, um, he didn't quite say we'll die for the country, but, I mean, he was all, almost on that path. Yeah. I mean, uh, this, I mean, Jesse, to me, I mean, since he's got to the Bulls, he's, he's always, when he was right at the beginning, he was always stood sort of above... Um, and a number of those players, two of the players around, I mean, more or less at the same time, was him and Hungary at that stage. And, I mean, they just, you know, they almost, you could see they were going to be superstars from the beginning. So I, I'm quite happy to see that as well. And just the last thing on Damien for, uh, for me, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, a couple of years ago, there was that whole sort of narrative flying around that Damien couldn't pass to the one side and, and, and uh, yeah, he, he, was only, he was so limited in the way he was a bit of a crash ball player, but and part of it was that he couldn't pass to the, I think it was left at that stage. Um, and I mean, that certainly been shown up as a bit of a, a joke, you know, that people who thought that he's certainly a great distributor as well. Okay, chaps, yeah. I think we are almost out of time. Uh, I think it's almost time for, for predictions. We should actually make a prediction or two. Yeah, I think so. Go on, Gav. Mm, I think we should, yes. Um, I was just going to say that um, just before we go on to the predictions that I do know what I was going to say to you was that Damien's also got quite a good, 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 good kicking boots as well, and um, there was talk of at one stage of him being able to play fullback at Western Province. Uh, I don't think he ever did, but um, yeah, he's he's a very talented rugby player, and uh, it's nice to know that there's a good rugby player that came out of Milnerton um, who is sort of like starting to develop as a as a rugby school down there as well. Not that I went to Milnerton, but I live in the area. Um, the predictions for Saturday. Careful now. Yeah, um, prediction for Saturday, South Africa to win. I we don't need think, you to I be a little bit more specific. Yeah, I think that they're going to win by more than last week. I think they're going to win by more than a score. They're going to win by what I said that they would last week. But they're going to actually, I think that the score is going to be 27 15. 27 15. Ireland nope. aren't going to score a try. They're going to get, they're going to get five penalties. And South Africa are going to score two tries. And, and, and Andre is going to kick his goals this week. And 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 and, and Sasha is going to come on and kick one as well, right at the end. Uh, yeah, I think they'll probably win by. by I was going to say by about ten. Uh, I think they will see a mole try from the box this week. I, I think they'll do that. Um, and we'll see some more scrum dominance. We might see um, Ireland getting a bit of their own breakdown medicine. Um, well, that's what I'm hoping for at least. Uh, and, and yeah, but I think it's going to be much more a tense test match. They it went. The box won't get away that early. They'll probably win later on in the game. Uh, but yeah, I was to see a Bok victory again. Uh, but yeah, Ireland are still a very good team, so it's going to be tough. Ireland yeah, really I'm going to go for a, a, um, yeah, that reminds me of a cricket reference. Uh, I was, I was, yeah, man, it's a Charles, anyway. it's Charles Fortune. Yeah, it was Charles Fortune. After a day when, the, when, when, when Natal had dominated them, Charles Fortune said at the end of the day, um, Natal have dominated today. But Transvaal are still a very good team. Sorry, sorry. Um, good. good day. <laughs> and then he said, "Good night." Um, um, okay, so I think yeah. that uh, <laughs> we should have actually closed on that note. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I think I think it's going to be a closer scoreline, but at the, the test itself um, won't be a reflection of that. So I think the box will win twenty fifteen, but it'll be a comfortable twenty fifteen. Um, so Ireland will kick their goals. They'll kick their penalties. Um, but they will be kept at arm's length um, for for most of the game, and in the end, I mean, the box will probably rue a few opportunities that they didn't. When I say rue, not lose the match by it, but they will look back at at, at some of those attacking opportunities that they didn't take. So, twenty fifteen for me. I was going to jump in and say, guys, that uh, yeah, yeah we're setting ourselves up uh, probably for a bit of egg on the face if uh, if Ireland do win. Uh, some of the Irish listeners, if we have some Irish listeners, will be thinking that right this moment. They're certainly capable but of yeah, winning. But yeah, I think, I think we've, we, yeah, they're very capable of winning. Uh, but yeah, the, I think we've we've probably said enough about the game now. I think we can we can almost end on that note. My my final thing would be just to say to you, gentlemen, well done that we've had a whole podcast that was a Matt Williams free zone that we uh, didn't talk about. Um, irrelevant stuff that doesn't matter that people try and get clickbait on 
and uh, that we kept it just rugby. So well done to all that. And uh, Gab, I'll see you down in Durban pretty soon. Um, I'll be down there tomorrow, and there are you also going down tomorrow. So we'll see each other down there, and we can uh, continue this over a beer. Or girls or what? Thanks for listening. And a reminder, you can find all the To The Last Drop podcasts on the Brendan Nell YouTube channel, iono.fm, Spotify, player.fm, Pocket Casts, Google Podcasts, and iTunes, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts.